Teresa Sakal, and today I'm going to talk about who cares why undefined is not a function. Uh, and if you do JavaScript, you probably do, and I used to as well, and I'm going to tell you a bit about my experience with that. Thank you. So I used to work in this uh, big project which does, it was kind of like Netflixy. it was really cool. Uh, so this little video of it, does it work? Yeah, so you can go watch TV and watch programs about famous people's homes, it was very cool. Yes? Or, cool? Is this better? I guess, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so everything was like fancily animated and real time updating and all that sorts. Uh, and initially when this was made, uh, it was made by one guy and it was when React was really popular or like getting popular and it's the same thing with like reactive streams. And he was also quite a big fan of like Backbone. So uh, he just did all of them and that's why how this was made. And the, later I talked to him about it and he was like, yeah, probably that was a little bit of an exotic choice. <laughs> um, but uh, Eventually, like uh, experimenting with these technologies is great, though. Like uh, it's vital to a development process, and uh, usually it works out if you have the time to like go back, reflect over your decisions, and learn from them. Uh, but that takes time as well. And at this project, we had a pretty strict deadline, and there wasn't time at all. Actually, we were under very general pressure. And so, uh, because everybody knows that a team's efficiency scales linearly with the amount of developers on it, then <laughs> uh, we were just added more developers to this team, and I was one of those developers who was added. Um, when coming into a project like this and not knowing all of the uh, technologies used, like I didn't know anything about streams, like what is flat map? I don't know. Like. Uh <laughs> um, so we were all these people and uh, there was just a question like, where do I keep my state? Becomes a very diff difficult question to answer because there's so many options for it. You can keep it in the backbone model and then send it down through reactive streams to the React mo the components or you can send it through uh, properties of, like in the React ones or you can keep it locally in the React component. And it turns out that everybody was just do like, whatever they felt most comfortable with. So some would do the reactive streams and it was not coherent at all through this application. And it's not like people didn't know that this wasn't the right way. It was just that we didn't feel like we had a choice. We just had to finish. And uh, we were just like told ourselves that we would fix it later. Uh, but this ended up being a lot of bugs in this application and we didn't have time to fix these things. So. And it would be bugs of all sorts, like it was slips of the hand as well as slips of the mind. Typos would end up places that, as well as like occasionally someone would, for example me, would forget to unsubscribe to one of these streams and uh, it would try to update a component which was already unmounted, paralyzing the whole page and giving a really bad user experience. And, but there were also like problems which we couldn't really solve either because like uh, the video play that we used on this page uh, would, is something that was just bought by the company. It was this black box of minified JavaScript code and whenever something went wrong, they would just be like, okay, e.a is, is not defined. I was like, thank you, that's not really helpful. <laughs> um, maybe if I poke you over here, you will stop crying. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, so we got stuck in this bad loop of like bugs showing up and then fixing them in a way that isn't really the way it should be fixed. And then, because we didn't really understand the code and things just went more and more wrong and then more bugs would show up and it would become a very toxic environment to work in, especially if you want to do a good job because all these developers were actually good developers. It was just that they, we didn't really, we weren't in a situation where it was possible to write good code. Uh, and this has a very severe emotional consequence for these developers because they want to do a good job and 
uh, most of them, when, in the end, when bugs came up, they would just be like, okay, who cares? Like, I'm tired, I'm gonna quit my job. And that's what they did. Like, the majority of these people in this team actually ended up quitting the job. And eventually it became apparent to this company that maybe we should change things up. This can't really go on. And there was massive, costly affair to change the culture and the management, introduce a lot of like refactoring, which was all the regressions came up. And it was just a costly affair, uh, both for the company as well as the individual. Um, so can we make this impossible? Because it's like, it's a pretty bad situation to be in. And this is what Elm tries to do, actually. Elm is a programming language which compiles to JavaScript, and its mission is to make programming uh, on the web platform delightful again. It's a purely functional language, which uh, some people see as quite a scary thing. Uh, but a pure function is just a function which always returns the same fun uh, value if given the same arguments. Uh, actually, like, and uh, Elm just has like only pure functions, and there's a lot of like jargon within functional programming which you don't actually have to use. Like, you don't have to know where the monad is or functor or not. Because I, actually, I argue that it's better if you don't. <laughs> I've met a lot of Haskell people, and they make things far too complicated. Um, uh, another quality that Elm has is that it's statically typed, uh, meaning that you have to respect types, not necessarily that you have to explicitly write all types, like you do in JavaScript occasionally, but it has type inference, which means that you don't have to worry about it. Also, uh, so with these two uh, qualities combined, excuse me, uh, it allows the compiler to efficiently analyze all of your code and weed out all sorts of typos, but also like general uh, logical incoherencies and let you know if there's some place where you're not handling errors that will result in a runtime error when you run it. Uh, I would like to show this, actually. Um, let's see. Um, so, do you know the to do app? This is, oh, this doesn't show. Can I fix that? <laughs> Maybe the end show. Oh, nope. Um, this was not checked. Can I? Oops. Maybe, sorry, switch the screen. Can I do this? Yeah, there you go. Okay, image. Right, okay, cool. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, can you see all this? So you know the to-do apps? Um, probably, they come in all sorts. Uh, this one is React, mostly because if I picked any other framework, I'll probably ruin it immediately. Uh, and I just wanted to show uh, some of the errors that it can weed out some which are more conspicuous than others. For example, in this, if we go in and have a typo in here, um, which is the double click, so usually you can do this and you can change the thing. And, but here, if you're doing JavaScript, it won't let you know. I'm clicking here and nothing happens. Uh, this probably wouldn't end up in production, but it's still something that you have to go back and forth between your browser and your code to check uh, whether you're doing the right thing or not. The, nothing will help you, really. Uh, other, if you do this in Elm, uh, the equivalent is over here. If I try to mess it up here, it will simply just tell me, we don't really understand this. Could you please pick one of the other ones? Maybe this one is the one you want. And it was. Thank you. Similarly, with any other like uh, typo, it will just, which you usually sometimes you will get like an error message. But you still have to go back and forth through uh, through the browser, and it's a lot. It's quite expensive. In Elm, with you will just the development process is more like you sit in here in your editor, you fix all the compiler errors, and when you come back to the browser and test things, it usually just works. 
somehow and very surprising. <laughs> um, but how does this work? In this, there aren't actually any runtime errors in this application, but it's also a rather small program. But if you do, uh, what does it look like in a large application? So there's a similar thing so it's to do, where it's a real world application it's called, where you have all these like, uh, you have a profile and you can do like homes and the feeds and stuff like that. And I thought it was going to be really difficult to actually find a bug because I figured that these people who made it was actually probably brilliant and in some miraculous way they've made a flawless application. Although it didn't actually, to my own surprise, take a lot before I found a place where it would end up in a runtime error. Like this is some sort of edge case on the profile. In, in the Elm one, this doesn't do it. It's the same uh, same profile. They share APIs in this thing. So it's only the front end that's different. And it's probably because the compiler let the author know that there's an edge case here that you have to handle. And it's not because Richard, who made this Elm um, thing, is like a better developer than the React people. It's just that he got so much help by the compiler figuring out everything and all the edge cases. Well, so it's not really the same discipline anymore. And the React is like the challenge is you have to remember 4,000 lines of code uh, in order to keep everything in order. While over here in the Elm world, it's like, do you understand the spec? OK, probably you'll, that will take you pretty far. <laughs> um, so this, like, over, this is a piece of that Elm application. If I just mess up anything, it will just tell me what I do wrong which is pretty neat. Um, I'm going to try to go back. Uh, don't know, gather windows. Mirror displays, no. OK. OK. I'll remember that for another time. Thank you. Um, OK. So you're probably wondering, uh, surely there's some sort of compromise. Uh, in the real, real world. Uh, there, I work for a company where we have uh, more than 100,000 lines of Elm code in production. And honestly, it's like, it's just kind of great. Like, <laughs> the only thing I could think of is that occasionally we'll have to make uh, some packages ourselves because the ecosystem isn't as large as the React one, for example. But it's a very pleasant experience, though, because you get to think about all sorts of other cooler problems, at least in my opinion, like data modeling. It's an interesting problem because it's also, like, in a, to a vast extent, determine how the rest of your code will turn out. And API design, like, I, this is one of the questions that I deal with most of the time in my work is, like, how do I design this module so that my 20 developer colleagues will understand immediately at a single glance what is going on and prevent them from misusing this API uh, in an unintentional way. So like, honestly, I don't really care if you use Elm. Like, <laughs> it's not really a problem for me. If you don't, if you don't like it, that's fine. But I mean, we're, we live in the same society and your happiness affects my happiness. So I want you to ask yourself about what questions you solve in your everyday, and if those are the questions that you actually want to solve. Because I think a lot of, at least my happiness, and a lot of engineers' happiness is dependent on this. And why undefined is not a function is not a problem that I'm interested in solving. So I use them. OK, that was all. Thank you.